Now let's begin looking at a more graphical way to perform logic minimization. And that's with using an approach called a Carnot map. So Carnot, or a K-map, is, is the name of a person. So let me write it out here. So Car, no. It was a guy by the name of Maurice Carnot, who was an American physicist who figured out a way to graphically minimize logic circuits in the 1950s while working for Bell Labs. So Carnot map, or for short, a K-map, is simply a graphical way to take a true table and put it into a grid form so that you can easily identify which variables can be removed from the canonical form. So it's, it's simply performing the same distributive complements and identity theorem process in order to remove variables, but it's something that we can do by hand graphically, and once we learn the algorithm, then it becomes uh, straightforward to implement that using a computer system. So to begin with, what we have to look at is the formation of a Carnot map. And when we talk about formation, <laughs> we're simply talking about taking a true table and putting it into a K-map form. We're not going to look at, we're not going to start with uh, how you actually do the minimization. We have to form the K-map first and then we look at the minimization. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. When we take a, let's start with a two input Carnot map. We're going to simply take a true table and we'll call it, well, we'll say it as input variables A and B. And let's just say we had 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and we had rows 0, 1, 2, 3. And let's just say the outputs were 0, 1, 0, 1. So what we can do now is we're going to take this true table and we're simply going to put it into a grid form. And notice that there was four rows in the true table. We are going to have what we call four cells in the grid. And so we're going to draw it like this. And each of these cells is going to represent one of the rows in the true table. So what we need to do then is we're going to have this diagonal line up here, and we're going to write the input variables that correspond to codes which, di which correspond to the rows and the columns of this thing. So let's take a look at, or what we do next is we put the input codes across the top for all values of A. So for example, A can take on a 0 and a 1. And then down the side here, we put all the input codes that B can take on. So we have 0 and 1. Now, when you look at this, it really each of these cells corresponds to the intersection of the input codes for, you know, a, of the column and the row. So this cell right here is where A was a 0 and B was a 0. So that is actually row 0. And a lot of times what you can do to make it easy to read is go ahead and put the row number up in the upper left corner of the cell. So we can say that in the true table, that's the row number. In the K-map, that's the cell number. But they're, they're the same thing. So right there is equivalent to, insert if we put the output F right there, it's the same information as in a uh, true table. Now, what we can also do, let's just continue that. This cell right here is when A is a 0 and B is a 1. So that is cell 1 corresponding to row 1. And then over here, we're going to have this cell is where A is a 1 and B is a 0. So that's row 2 or cell 2. And then finally, we have this is where A is a 1 and B is a 1. So that's row 3. So this right here is the K-map equivalent to an empty truth table. And then what we do is we come along and we put the outputs in there. So we go 0, 1, 0, 1. Now, all, this is the exact same information. It is just in a grid format. And we'll see as we go why it's important. Putting it in this grid format with some, some additional rules are going to allow us to easily identify which variables are needed in order to create product terms or some terms in order to, res in order to create the proper outputs. Another thing that's of interest is when we go to start looking at which variables are important in the final logic expression, what we can do is we can actually label the rows and the columns corresponding to whether the inputs uh, are a 1 or a 0. Now, when we do this, what we want to do is think about a sum of products first. And remember when a sum of products, when the input variable is a 1, we, in we include it in our terms uncomplemented. So that would be, this would be the column corresponding to the variable A. So an A is a 1. So I can actually write it down here. 
Then what I can do is I can say this is the column right here where A is a zero. So if I wrote that in terms of its variable notation, that would be the column corresponding to A naught. And then over here what we can do is we can write this is the row corresponding to B naught and this is the row corresponding to B. So this right here provides additional information in terms of in terms of how to interpret the actual results. Okay, remember at this point we're still not minimizing anything. So let's now form a three input K map. And when we go to a three input K map, we have to introduce one more rule and this final rule of the K map formation is is super important in terms of identifying variables. So what we're going to have is we'll have let's let's use a b and c again as our input variable names and let's come along so we're going to have eight possible input codes so 0000001 010 011 and I'll put a little divider and I'll go 100101 110 110 111 and these are rows 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 28 29 30 31 32 33 34 35 36 37 38 39 40 41 42 43 44 45 46 47 48 49 50 51 52 53 54 55 56 57 58 59 60 
differ in their input codes by one, or one and only, the input codes, just say it a different way, only one bit changes in between the, the input codes when you talk about the neighbors. Okay, the neighbors though, it's very important that neighbors are this way and this way, okay? So you, only, you don't have diagonal neighbors. Diagonal neighbors, that doesn't exist in the K-map because we want a neighbor to be defined as, so a neighbor is defined as two cells who have input codes that differ by only one change, okay? So that means these guys are neighbors right here, these guys are neighbors right here, these guys are actually neighbors right here, so if I can wrap around, uh, these, this is a neighbor with this going that way. It's also a neighbor like this going that way. And that becomes very important because the graphical form of the K-map allows us to isolate variables that can be removed from the final logic expression. Okay, so let's continue. So that was the final rule that we have. Uh, let's, let's continue forming this. So what I'm going to come is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to label these cell numbers, which correspond to the row numbers. So it's very simple starting out. It's 0, 1, and then 2, and then 3. But then four is actually over here. So I'm going to have four over here and five over here. And that's just because of the way that we had to have only one input code changing between neighbors. And this, this is becomes one of the most common mistakes when you do a K-map is forgetting that row four jumps over to here. So you go zero, one, two, three, and then you have to jump over here, four, five, and then come back. And then you put six right here seven right here. So that becomes important when you put the outputs in the K-map. So let's do this one. We'll pop them in there. So one, zero, one, one. Then I have to jump over here, zero, zero, and then I come back here and I go one, one. So this is the exact same information as the truth table. It's just in a grid format, and it's in a grid format that any neighboring cell only differs by its neighbors by one. Okay. Let's label the uh, the input variables also, just like we did over here. And again, remember, this is we're going to label them for an SOP because that's how we start learning this stuff. So if I came along, I want to look at where A is a 1, or A is a 1 and A is a 0. So if you look at A, it is a 1 right here, and it's a 1 right here. So these two columns are actually where A is uncomplimented. These two columns here are where A is a zero, so I would label this one as A naught. Let's look where B is a zero and a one. So let's start where B is a one. So B is a one right here and right here, so I'll put the label down here just because I already used the top. So I'll have a B down there. And then in this column over here, where B is a zero, uh, actually B is a zero right here, B is a zero right here, that's where B naught is. So I'm gonna write it like this, and, and I have B naught here and I have B naught there. These are neighboring cells. It's just representing that it wraps around. So you can kind of think of it as it goes off the page to the left and comes back on the right. So that's where B is a, is a zero and we write as B naught when we try to do SOP synthesis. Okay, so finally let's come back and let's put C naught here because that's where C is a zero. And then we have C right there. So we formed a three input K-map, and we introduced this rule of the neighbors can only differ by one. So the last one that we look at is a four input K-map. And let's go ahead and form that. So this one is very similar to the last two, it's just that we have more cells. So let's now say we have four inputs, and we'll call them A, B, C, and D. And we'll have an output of F, and now in this situation, we have two to the four input codes. So we actually have 16 possible codes. <clears throat> so let's write them all down. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. And this is where you get a lot of practice counting in binary when you write these true tables. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. And then you have 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. And I always put dividers every four just to keep it kind of straight. And then finally you have one one zero zero one one zero one 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 zero one 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 one. And that corresponds to a row of zero one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen and fifteen. So there's my true table. And let's just put some res some values in here. So let's just say we had zero 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 zero. 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0.
So these are just some circuit have this behavior. So let's go ahead and draw the K map. So what I'm going to do is in this situation I need 16 cells. So I'm going to have four columns and four rows. So I draw the K map just like this. So this is how I get 16 cells. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to list the input variables up here, comma delimited. So I go A comma B and then C comma D or I space them out. You can also space them as long as it's clear that they're two independent variables. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the input codes 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Again, I had to count it like that because the input codes couldn't differ by more than one. And then when I go down the side here, I have to do the same thing. So C and D go 0, 0, 0, 1, and then I go 1, 1, 1, 0. It's important to keep this in, in, in mind when you list the cell numbers because they go like this now. zero. 1, and then 2 is down here. So I come down here and I have 2, and then up here is 3. Then I come over here and I go 4, 5, and down here I go 6, and 7, and then I jump over to here. This is going to be cell 8, cell 9, down here is cell 10, here is cell 11. Then I come back to the, this third column and I go this is cell 12, this is cell 13, jump down here, this is cell 14, and this is cell 15. So this is where it can be a little more confusing when you bring in these output values because when I enter them, I have 0, 0, 0, 0. So that one's easy, but I go 0, 0, jump down here, 0, 0. Come to this column, and I go 1, 1, jump down here, 1, 0. Then I have to jump over to this column, and I go 0, 0, jump down here, 0, 0. Then I come back and I finally go 1, 1, jump down here, 1, 0. So just you, you have to be careful as you move from the true table into cells. So the last step in this is let's, let's label where these variables are 1s and zeros, as if we were going to synthesize an SOP, where we'll label these columns and rows where the variable is uncomplemented if it's a 1, complemented if it's a 0. So let's start with A. Just like uh, in the 3 input, we're going to have a right here is where A is a 1, these two columns. Right here are the two columns where A is a 0. And then we're going to come down here and again B is a 1 for these two columns. And then B is a 0 for these two columns. So I label it B not. But then we have C and we have D. So let's look at C and we'll put it over here on the left. So right here is where C is a 1 and right here is where C is a 0. And then over here, we have D is a 1 for these middle two rows. And then, just like we did with the B naught, we're going to have what we call a wraparound, where D is a 0 in these locations. So you can think of that going like that. So this is the formation. Now the question becomes, what about a 5 input? Well, you usually stop by hand once you get to 4 input. Because what we're really doing is, you, you don't necessarily do this when you design digital logic, but you use this algorithm in order to implement computer software which will do the minimization for you. So we usually, we learn 2 input, 3 input, and 4 input K maps in order to understand how we can minimize logic expressions. And once we understand that, then we, imp we automate it using a computer tool, and then that will ex extend to 5 and 6 and, you know, any arbitrary number of inputs. So we usually usually stop at 4 and you don't learn 5. Uh, again, it's because you don't, you don't do, in, other than very small circuits, you usually don't do the minimization by hand. We're just learning this in order to learn the algorithms that the computers will use to minimize their logic. Okay, so that's the formation of K-maps.